Welcome to this episode of May I Interrupt. My name is Craig Norman. I'm the co-host uh, of this ongoing podcast. My partner and other co-host, Dr. Jason Jedlicka, is here today. Hello, everyone. Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. Fantastic. We're here on the show floor of uh, Global Specialty Lens Symposium, the last day. Everybody's had a great time. Everybody's worn out. Thinking about napping and going home. A few nights of Las Vegas has caught up with everybody just a little. Exactly. But first, we have a tremendous guest today, Jason. Yes, we do. Our guest, Dr. Greg Denier from Columbus, Ohio. We could spend a lot of time talking about your accolades, but this is only a 20-minute show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the bio could take 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. So, Greg, what we'd really like to have you do is tell us about how you got interested in specialty lenses, right? Okay. Yeah. Especially yeah. your path down scleral lenses. Right. And to where you are today in right. that journey over the last, I'm guessing, 12, 13, 14 years, whatever it is, or more. Yeah, more. I, you know, it's funny, that's a great question, and I don't have, I haven't had the typical route that even a lot of uh, current, younger specialty con contact lenses fitters have had, because when I graduated in 1998 from the Ohio State College of Optometry, I actually was uh, interested in the medical model of optometry. That, at that time, LASIK was busy. Uh, optometrists were doing more glaucoma care. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that that's what the future was. And so I actually did a v VA residency, mm -hmm. a, me a medical uh, training residency for one year <laughs> and had no interest in contact lenses. <laughs> and after my residency, I ended up staying in Columbus, which is where I reside now with my wife. And I started working in an anterior ophthalmology practice. We had two cornea specialists. And even though there wasn't a plan for me to do contact lenses, my real role was uh, helping LASIK patients, uh, pre and post-op, and also glaucoma patients. But invariably, as I was there a little bit longer, the uh, cornea specialist would have a patient that had irregularity and they would say, Greg, can you help this patient out with a contact lens? Yeah. And I'll just be frank and honest with you, I said yes, but I had no idea what I was doing. Because even though I had great training at Ohio State, there, I didn't have much experience or exposure to patients with cornea irregularity. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I still remember the first patient, older uh, lady patient that I fit. She had a transplant, had no idea what I was doing. She was 2400. I ordered a lens from Art Optical with maybe some K readings or whatnot. <laughs> really no yeah. science to it. Guessing, and guess what? It worked. And just out of luck. And I thought, Wow, this is a great niche. This is something that I could really do to help patients. That the was bug a, bit you. <laughs> that was a corneal gas perm contact lens. So I started. So I said. So I got into it, and uh, this was in 1999, 2000, mm -hmm. and I started fitting all these patients with corneal GP lenses. The problem is, one of the cornea specialists in our practice uh, also did in his day in the 1980s a lot of RK surgery. Mm -hmm. So we were at, even at that time getting some of these patients back corneal regularity. Well, you know what it's like, sure. yeah. both you guys, to fit an RK patient with a corneal GP right. lens, especially if it's not specially designed for an oblate cornea. Mm -hmm. And so I was having all kinds of trouble. Well, somebody at the Ohio State College of Optometry, I was having this discussion with, they had actually mentioned this scleral lens. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, okay. And I, I had actually heard about the Boston Foundation for Sight. And I thought, you know what, I want to try this. So I ended up ordering a diagnostic kit from CNH uh, contact lenses. Oh, yeah. Do you guys remember them oh, out, of, yeah. out of Dallas? Yeah. They, they became so clear yeah. eventually. Mm -hmm. But it was a scleral lens set that I, I can't remember exactly. It was like 13 and a half, 14 Thir millimeters. 13, 8 or something, yeah. I believe. Right now, 13, 8, which is like insanely small. But at that time, I thought it was massively large. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I and I think they called it macro lens. Right? Yeah, macro lens. Yeah. Yeah. At 13.8. So anyway, at that time, this is around 2000, um, I had 
no training. This was before there was workshops and there was just a handful of people across the country fitting contact lenses. Square lenses including you guys. But I actually didn't even know that you had to fill the bowl with, with solution. Mm -hmm. But I still remember the first patient that I put a scleral lens on. She was a, a patient with keratoconus. And I put the lens on without solution. <laughs> it was flat enough. I didn't need it. Mm -hmm. But it's centered. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So that's what really jump-started me into the, the scleral lens world. And... You know, at, again, at that time, not a lot of people were fitting lenses. And so, I, I, by definition, I was way ahead of the curve right. uh, in that process. Right. Right. And I thought, I would read articles sometimes on on fitters that, you know, they would write articles about um, fitting lenses and their case reports. And I thought, you know what? I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. Why can't right. I also contribute? And so... I'd actually, I came here, my, my first meeting here to Vegas was at the Global Keratoconus Congress. Right, right. And I was so excited to be here because it was just, you know, my first experience into this world with a whole bunch of other people having the same interests that I do. Yeah. And I was talking to Chris Sint and I was telling her about how, you know, what advice did she have for me if I wanted to start writing articles or lecturing? And she said, she said, the best advice I can give you is take a picture of everything. Mm. And so that's what I started to do. <clears throat> and then I, I also devoted, I said, at least every day I would spend 15 minutes at least doing something in the regard to specialty lenses, mm -hmm. either, you know, trying to figure out and improve my own knowledge about them or putting together lectures or writing and that type of thing. And, you know, just slowly that ballooned to now in 2024, I spend most of my time fitting specialty contact lenses. Most of that time is fit. Fitting squirrel content. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. That's great advice, though, to someone who wants to be better at it. Yeah. That yeah. you had that discipline to, well, A, to take the photos, but, but B, to devote time every day to building that knowledge and skill um, very disciplined way. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about this photo thing, and I mm. think back to the days when I was at Cleveland Clinic, and my favorite person on the eye floor was the photographer. I took care of her all the time. I bought her lunch all the time. I do all these things. And anytime she found a really interesting corneal slide, right? Slide, slide, right? Yeah, yeah. Slide, she just she'd slide, yeah. pull them aside, put them in a little sleeve for me. And that's the way you build your inventory. Now yeah. our inventory is oh. on our laptop. But right, correct. right, right, right. And it, I think when I'm putting material that, like that together, or even a lecture like for, for this meeting, you know, sometimes the photographs are the start of your presentation mm -hmm. or the lecture or the idea. Mm -hmm. And they're so critical and important to convey the information. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine what would a square lens lecture be like if you didn't have any photos. Yeah. Right? So it is, it is critical. And now we have videos and... It's, it's so much even easier to get and, and capture those images and, and videos as needed. So right. it's uh, it's a really important if you want to go on and lecture, but even if you're just a fitter, to be able to send that information to the consultants at the manufacturer that you're using. Really, you know, it's a picture. Um, a picture is a thousand words. Type, mm -hmm. type yeah. thing. So, of course, you evolve from being a fitter to a designer, right? To, we right. developed an right. interest in designing yep. lenses yep. and also developed an interest in, in a corneal topography and right. anterior segment right. measurement. So, right. you know, that's you two guys have this in common, of yep. course. And yeah. so what, what kickstarted that? Well, I think I've just been lucky that I've, I've been, oftentimes been the, it, been the right person, the right time in the right place. And, you know, my... When I was thinking about scleral shape, uh, for example, you know, our, our frustrations were that, you know, we, we were mostly at, at, the, at the start fitting spherical landing zones. And you know what? The thing is, the advantage of scleral contact lenses and probably one of the reasons it actually ever took off is because scleral lenses are so forgiving, despite yes. mm -hmm. not necessarily matching the scleral lens design that you're using with the, with the, eye, the particular eye you're fitting. But still, we have complications. And so I, I think I always had in my mind that in the end, what I would, my desire was to help create technology that would measure the surface shape of the eye and then that lens design would ultimately 
be used yeah. in court in accordance with that shape. And so that's that's how that all started. And um, you know, it's 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 really taken off. Obviously, I think I'm a little surprised that even since 2016 uh, and actually before, when 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 corneal scleral topography was first available, that we really actually haven't seen more practitioners using this now technology in 2024 because the reality is that the vast majority of scleral contact lenses fit across the world are still fit using only diagnostic lenses. Mm -hmm. So I I think there's there's going to be a tipping point at some stage where that changes, but you know, certainly the early adapters are there and we're a bit beyond that as well. But we'll see what happens maybe even over the next 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is kind of silly that uh, fitting a scleral lens without a scleral map is a bit like trying to fit a corneal GP where you haven't even measured Ks. You're literally just going to your diagnostic set and throwing a lens on. Yeah. No clue whether this is going to have a big air bubble right. or be so flat it flies off, and yet that is how we do it. Right. Um, I think part of the holdup for a lot of people is, is they look at it and they say, well, the instrument costs this amount and I can't bill very much for it. Right. And, and a lot of times we get stuck on the return on investment of the instrument, not realizing that the amount of time you can spend on a diagnostic fitting with right. no data right. is minutes and hours and hours versus if I have that data, I can accomplish this in half the time. And of course, our time is so valuable. Yeah. So it's just having that big, big picture. Well, and it's metrics point. that are acquired not by yourself, right? Oh yeah. Right. I mean, it's, so it's there's that part involved as well. You're busy doing something else in the right. practice. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it's yeah, it is volume related to a point to get your ROI, but. But yeah, I think if you're a serious fitter, uh, volume is important, and then beyond that, you really need to invest in the technology mm-hmm. you know, to, to, make, to make sure that you're practicing at the highest level. Yes. Yeah. It's important for your patient care. But you know, that's another great point, because in, in some of our recent episodes we've done here just these last few days, we've talked a lot about how adding the instrumentation allows you to basically develop a new clinic or a new part of a practice that yeah. didn't exist at all before. Yeah, absolutely. And so you say, well, you know, I kind of, you you would say it's volume dependent, and of course it is. And you'd say, well, I only fit two sclerals a month. So, but when you add that instrument, you could, you're going to start getting referrals. You're going to fit yeah. more patients because you'll find it's very efficient and more enjoyable. And you could just by virtue of owning the equipment, you could grow that exponentially well, I tell practitioners too. I mean, scleral lens fitting in particular is becoming very competitive now. There's a lot of a lot of uh, other practitioners doing it. So, in your micro environment, if you have a, a scleral topographer and your other competitors don't, that's really something that you can also use as a marketing device, as you know, sort of a high, a higher tech option. Yeah, I have a family member that recently went to their optometrist and needed to have OCT. Mm. and had to reschedule for a month later when the traveling OCT was coming. Ouch. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's yeah. like, really? You know? Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And it's expensive, too. Yeah, yeah, expensive, right? And yeah. then, but then meanwhile, you're wondering, my family members wondering for a month, what's going on with my eyes? Well, right. 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 Well, it just doesn't yeah. create a very good impression of a practice when you think this test is critical to have done, and yet, I'm not willing to invest in it myself to own it right. and to offer it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, Greg, what's next? What do you think's happening? So, we're going to get more use of yeah. corneal scleral topography. I, I, I think at some point in time, yeah, that's going to really take off. We're going to reach a, a tipping point or threshold where a majority of the fits then at some stage are fit with corneal scleral, scleral topography or impressions or, you know, something else. I mean, I think what, what's interesting to me and to consider is, in that regard, is how is AI going to play a role yeah. you know, in all that someday? Because almost assuredly, it is at some stage going yeah. to play some role for us. Yeah. So that's so, exciting. So what, what do you think, though? So first of all, I agree. But what I don't understand is what does AI mean in particular to, like, design? Sure. What does AI mean in particular to... Um, you know, 
small diameter versus large diameter. I've seen some other uses of AI, it's kind of interesting. I wrote a one-page column using AI, where I, all I asked AI was, can you list for me the five, five reasons to use specialty contact lenses? Yeah. And boom, yeah. it spit it out, yeah. it took no editing. Yeah. I sent it to Jason Nichols and said, what, what do you think of this? Yeah. This is pretty good. Yeah. 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 I said, I didn't write a single word of right. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand how it does it for content. So my yeah. question is, how would it do it in I, lens design? I, the way I see it is just in, improved algorithms and in mm -hmm. analyzation of the data. You know, yeah. just being able to expand all that because it can do it so fast yeah. and so much better than, than in, any, in any way we've been able to it so far. So I, that's where I see it. And are we going to be able to get that into big data where you, it's not just your practice information? It's I mean, a manufacturer theoretically could, could, could say exactly. as long as you consent to have your information analyzed and right. added to a larger database. Right. De-identified in some yeah. manner. Right. And just right. But that's exactly what I was thinking, too, is... is right now to refine an algorithm requires somebody to sit down and look at numbers it's very laborious stare at an Excel yeah. and it, and it yeah. only gets updated when you actually sit down and do it yeah. with AI it can be happening in the moment it's happening every day it can yeah. be updating and I, I think of the papers that Jason and I were involved in on, on scale shape and the amount of time and energy and effort it took to analyze all those cases for one person mm -hmm. when you know, in the future, an AI software system could probably do that in yeah. much less time. Moments. Yeah. Seconds. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Seconds. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think contact lenses actually lend themselves really well to AI because it's so data and numbers driven. It, there's, we talk about the art and science of contact lens fitting. And the reality is, is we really should be pushing more towards the science side. Right. than relying on the art side. Yeah. Yep. And, and AI blends in with that, I think. Yeah. So. yeah, good. So, without, you know, spilling any beans, are you working on AI for no. lens design? No, I, I wish I was, but it is, it is in the forefront of my mind. And I think, like you guys, I'm just trying to, at least in a philosophical way, understand where that will be positioned and then mm -hmm. how we will use it, you know, effectively. Mm -hmm. But I, it's it's certainly coming. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, you know, I don't want anything to do with AI. Mm -hmm. You know, while they're typing something on their phone and it's being auto-corrected right. Right. by or, AI. Or, or you right. get three letters typed and it already knows what word you're, and it, it puts, exactly. fills in the exactly. rest of your phrase right. for you. Right. But you're afraid of AI. <laughs> yeah, <you're>, right. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, there's a story that the, the Google Google created an AI system to analyze the 3D structures of proteins. And it used to be that it would take a PhD student four to five years to do one protein. That was their oh, PhD wow. thesis. Wow. This system that was put out last year can do it in 10 seconds. Yeah. So yeah. It, is, it is about big data. It is about improving efficiency. And, and someday we'll look back. I When, when we were talking about corneal skull topography, I always thought that someday if my kids were scleral lens fitters, they would look back at diagnostic fitting, like, how did this even work? Yeah. How were you even successful with this? Yeah. Because you didn't have enough information. They would and, think your name was like Helmholtz. So. Right, yeah, back to <laughs> FIC or right. you know, something, something right. like that. So as we're about to bring this to a close, Jason, do you have any well, burning yeah. question for Greg? I'm just so curious as to know between your practice, between what you do, with your side um, scleral lens activities, um, you know, thinking to the next 10, 15 years of your career, mm -hmm. do you have interest in anything new and different than what you're already doing? I don't know, I, I think I right now have a very good work-life balance, mm -hmm. and I've actually cut back a little bit in the clinic to allow for some more flexibility. And I tell you, I, I would never say never to other opportunities, but I still really love patient care. I, I love being able to be in clinic with patients, provide them care, to see all those happy moments when you truly change somebody's life. Yeah. So it's really gonna be hard to ever tear me away from that. I'm not <laughs> saying it couldn't happen, but I really like that. And I, I'll continue to do research and lecture and write articles. and. I mean, I, I think about what I was doing to prepare for this meeting. I 
when you do stuff like that, you guys know, you learn yourself. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait, I didn't even know that. Yeah. And so I love that aspect of it. It helps keep me fresh and attuned to everything on the forefront of our profession. Yeah, I always felt that lecturing made me a better clinician and being a better clinician made me a better lecturer, right? 100%. And so they all work it's, so it's, much together. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Greg, thank you so much for today. This You're is such welcome. a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you for having but me. Around here, we don't allow you to walk away empty-handed. Oh, okay. Instead, you get the parting gift. Wait, I thought these. I thought I thought you were out of these. We were, but oh, you know what? We saved this it just for you. you. Oh wow! Thanks, just guys. For, just for I, you. I appreciate that. In addition, <laughs> not oh. sure how much you like to golf. All my boys do. But some. Uh, may I interrupt? Golf balls. Okay. Thank you can you. have. Uh, you have two. Two or boys. Two boys. Oh, yeah. We better oh, wow. give you uh, two sleeves, one for each of them. Okay, thank you. They'll, They'll appreciate, appreciate those. They will, absolutely. Right? Thank you so much. Since this is something that lifespan is measured in minutes. Correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> That's right. And thank you for watching and listening to this episode of May I Interrupt? We really appreciate your time. Stay tuned for a future episode coming soon. Thank you.